Welcome, my name is Susan Ratcliffe, and today I'm going to share with you an overview of a new cast paper, Crop Protection Contributions Towards Agricultural Productivity. Before we get started, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Matt Bauer, Hugh Becky, Lauren Giesler, Norm Lepla, and Jill Schrader. In addition, I'd like to thank our cast liaison, Gary Brewer from the University of Nebraska, and our three reviewers, Carl Bradley, Fred Gould, and Bob Wright. The goals and objectives of the paper are to assess the impact of technologies on crop production, review current and future plant protection technologies, and provide future pr crop protection recommendations. And here we have a couple of pests. On the left, the Colorado potato beetle larva, which is native to the U.S., and on the right, we have the brown marmorated stink bug, which is a introduced invasive species to the U.S. Here we have a figure that uh, uh, shows the potential impact of crop protection on yield and productivity. And if we look at the two bars on the left, we can see we have attainable yield, potential loss, and then our actual yield. And the left bar is a scenario without crop protection. And you can see that uh, we have a drastic reduction in yield. And the middle bar or the right bar uh, on the left side uh, shows that with the inputs of crop protection, our yield is increased dramatically. On the right, the bar shows a lower attainable yield, and this is a scenario without pesticide use. And so even with other crop protection technologies, our yield is not at the same level that we can attain when we have the pesticides in our toolbox as well. So it, it clearly illustrates the importance of pesticides and crop protection technologies on our crop production system and yields. Here's another figure that shows potential loss and actual loss. And across the bottom, you see the um, pest categories. And on the um, y-axis, we have the percent of loss. And while we would see some sort of loss uh, across the board, weeds uh, would certainly have the most significant impact if we did not have control practices that provide us with the great efficacy that we currently enjoy in our crop protection technology approaches. There are many benefits to crop protection technology. They include uh, the fact that GMO crops are closing the gap between the potential and actual yield estimates. Plant disease management has increased farm income by 13 billion. We've seen a reduction in tillage by 36% as a result of herbicide resistant crops. Growers have received a 19 to 1 return on investment from insecticide applications. And We've estimated the benefit from GMO crops in 2013 at over $20 billion, and we've also seen increased yields with an additional 195 million tons of maize and an additional 110 million tons of soybean between 1996 and 2011. With that said, we also have to consider uh, how we preserve our crop protection tools. And there's a number of factors that contribute to resistance. The broad application of a single tactic, uh, which is demonstrated here in the image on the right, uh, crop rotation in the Midwest had been used for three or four decades um, on massive uh, acreages. And as a result, Western corn rootworm uh, developed uh, variant that overcame crop rotation, and, and this is a result of the damage following a windstorm. Uh, lack of crop or tool rotation. Off-label use of pesticides can also uh, be a contributor to resistance in pest populations. 
So we like to recommend best management practices, which includes the appropriate use of tools to make decisions while protecting yield and crop quality and diversifying management tools to reduce the likelihood of pest resistance. Here's a table that shows the level of adoption of GM crops by country, and you can see that the U.S. Um, has broadly adopted GM hybrids for soybean, maize, cotton, and canola, and other um, countries have done so as well. The problem is when we see this broad adoption with limited alternatives within the GM hybrids, um, it sets up a situation where there is a potential for resistance to develop in the pest species. So we often recommend integrated pest management, which is a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic health and environmental risk. And so IPM focuses on pest prevention and uses monitoring, record keeping, and economic thresholds to make management decisions. And here we have an example of a couple of individuals scouting for insects in a vegetable plot. And we also have an image of tar spot on corn, which was found uh, in some fields in northern Illinois recently. We also looked at prophylactic versus threshold or site-based use of pesticides. And the prophylactic-based use um, can have some negative uh, effects. It can increase costs of production. It can increase pest resistance. It can increase human exposure to pesticides. And it can also increase environmental risks. So, we look at threshold-based uses, which should have economic benefits, human and health benefits, um, and also prolong the efficacy of our crop protection tools. We have a diagram here that illustrates the use of preventative practices, and it shows two different pathways for an invasive pest depending on whether it moves into a vulnerable crop, which would then move it into a pesticide program uh, where we would need to identify uh, pesticides that have efficacy against the, the pest, perhaps develop new formulations, look at application methods, and then also consider the potential for resistance management. Or if the invasive pest moves into a crop that has resistance or resistant varieties, um, then we may not need to move into a pesticide program, but we may be able to deploy a IPM program uh, that may include reduced risk pesticides, but it also is going to be looking at cultural practices, conservation of competitors and natural enemies, and of course, looking for the potential of resistance management um, issues with regard to the overuse of any of these practices as well. Threshold-based limitations and alternatives also have to be considered. Plant pathogen thresholds have limited uses, so we often uh, use predictive forecasting tools uh, because we find that they provide greater treatment accuracy. And weed thresholds also have limited uses because one plant can produce more than 100,000 seeds. So we find that with weed management, uh, decisions should be based on yearly mapping and regular scouting of the fields. And here we have an image of Palmer amaranth seed head, and you can see that um, these are very large and they produce hundreds of thousands of seeds per plant. We looked at a number of emerging technologies. Pest surveillance is gonna be playing a critical role as we move forward. Um, scouting, traps, attractants, drones. Here we have a drone scouting a field in North Dakota. Uh, the use of GIS-based real-time mapping has been very useful. Uh, a couple of examples would be the IPM pipe, the iPipe, and uh, Georgia's Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health 
And on the right, we have two images from the IPM pipe. The upper image is from April 5th, 2016, and it shows um, areas that have been scouted for soybean rust and where it's been confirmed or not found. The lower image is um, for soybean rust as well, but this is October 1st, 2016, and you can see that the presence of soybean rust has been confirmed in a much larger geographical area. And this type of information uh, is delivered in real time to growers and they can sign up for alerts. So uh, this is a very important system for growers that have uh, the potential of uh, uh, this type of pathogen moving into their fields. We also need to uh, use our pest identification tools if we don't know what we have, we can't manage it effectively. And we have apps, molecular identification techniques, distance diagnostics, and the National Plant Diagnostic Network. And all of these um, components uh, will aid us in our pest identification. On the left, we have the corn earworm. Uh, in the upper image and the lower image is the old world old world bollworm, uh, which um, is currently in South America, and uh, uh, we hope it stays there because it's been referred to as the corn earworm on steroids. A number of apps have been developed uh, by um, norma, uh, numerous groups and organizations, and uh, a lot of these tools have been a great aid uh, at field level uh, because they help us make decisions uh, in real time. Pest exclusion is a technology that can be very useful. Uh, these include port inspection technologies, quarantines, eradication of pests, and area-wide management. Uh, here we have the th three different life stages of the European grapevine moth. It was introduced to California in 2009, and in 2016, they indicated they have successfully eradicated it from California. Cultural practices can play a very important role in pest management as well. These include resistant cultivars, crop rotation, tillage, planting and harvesting date alteration, fertilization and irrigation, and on the left we have an image of a citrus orchard that um, is exhibiting citrus greening, and on the right we have the two psyllids that vector citrus greening, the Asian citrus psyllid and the African citrus psyllid. Uh, this is an invasive pest that we did not get ahead of, and it has devastated the Florida citrus industry. Physical controls can play a very important role. Those include robotics, flaming of weeds, tillage, traps, barriers, mulches, and plasticulture. On the left, we have a demonstration of flaming weeds from University of Nebraska, and on the right upper, uh, we have traps in fruit orchards looking for insect pests, and the lower right image is a tractor that is mounted with a system that's spraying corn grit to shred the leaves of weeds growing between the crop rows. Behavioral controls are another method that can be uh, very important in crop protection. These include sterile insect techniques as well as mating disruption. And here on the left, we have a image of a adult codling moth. It's a major fruit pest. And on the right upper, we have the exterior of a apple that has been infested by a codling moth larva. And lower right is what the exit hole looks like on the inside and the extensive damage uh, from tunneling that was made by the codling moth larva. Biological controls can also be a technology that can be deployed. We've seen a um, expansion of biopesticides lately. Also, uh, 
We can deploy endoparasites, parasitoids, predators, and herbivores. Uh, we've had a lot of success in wetlands uh, using herbivores to eliminate purple loose strife, which is an invasive um, non-native plant. These types of approaches may have uses in crop production systems as well. Um, on the right, we have a parasitized tomato hornworm. It's covered with pupating raconid wasp, which will soon emerge and uh, fly off to pupate other hornworm caterpillars. We also um, looked towards pesticides and while we have a, a wonderful selection in our toolbox, we believe that we also need to explore new modes of action, improved formulations, and alternative delivery systems such as baits. Um, and while some may argue that the imported fire ants are not an agricultural pest, um, they will populate both urban and rural areas, and because of their uh, swarming nature, and their um, painful stings, um, it's important to manage uh, fire ants in your agricultural production systems and it's also an excellent example of understanding the biology of the insect pest and circumventing its um, uh, ability to overcome our technologies by uh, using things such as baits to uh, have the insects themselves help distribute the pesticide within the nest. Another emerging technology that we examine is pesticide application technology. And those include seed treatments, site-specific sp site smart technology, ultra-low volume application, pesticide injection, and soil drenches. On the left, we have a picture of fungicide-treated rice seeds. And on the left, we have an example of the efficacy of an insecticide seed treatment where it protected the rice roots from the rice water weevil. We also have a lot of molecular techniques that are making tremendous strides, RNAi, CRISPR, rapid sequencing, all of these laboratory techniques are providing us with greater insight uh, into what makes these pests tick, how they're conferring resistance into their populations, and also giving us a new set of tools to use to combat the various pests. Aedes aegypti is a major vector of Zika, and while Zika is not considered a crop protection pest necessarily, the technologies could be used in pests of crop production systems. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of strides with regard to some molecular techniques to address western corn rootworm populations, as well as sweet potato whitefly. And we have future recommendations. Uh, we want to prevent resistance to the available pesticides. We need to advance genomic and molecular approaches for developing pest-resistant plants. We need to continue to improve our attractants, traps, scouting, and diagnostics so that we can rapidly detect new invasive pests. We need to incentivize growers to adopt IPM systems. We need to prevent introductions or rapidly eradicate invasive species. We need to integrate crop production and protection in a more holistic manner. And we need to develop more selective pesticides with new modes of action, especially in the area of herbicides and fungicides. So with that, I'll stop and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you.